Welcome to another presentation with data and perspective you'll find nowhere else. This presentation is entitled Parkinson's Disease and the Microbiome. We're not going to review the disease itself, nor address any dietary or prescription measures. This review is intended to take a deep dive into the connection between Parkinson's disease and the microbiome and how it can be modulated to hopefully garner benefit. We have a number of quotes from various papers highlighting a prominent theory on the origination of Parkinson's disease. In the coming slides, we'll take a look at these factors in more detail. Please note the theorized connection between dysbiosis, gut permeability, immune activation, oxidation and inflammation, and protein misfolding and aggregation. Also important here is evidence and symptoms in the gut years before neurological impact, giving rise to a theory of the vagus nerve as the guilty conduit connecting the gut to the brain. Here we see three studies highlighting the connection between constipation and Parkinson's. Gastrointestinal dysfunction, in particular constipation, affects up to 80% of Parkinson's patients and may precede the onset of motor symptoms by years. Idiopathic constipation is one of the strongest risk factors for Parkinson's. Prolonged intestinal transit time and constipation are associated with neurodegenerative changes in the enteric nervous system. These changes can be found in the earliest stages of Parkinson's, sometimes years before motor symptoms occur, and therefore have been suggested as a premotor biomarker. Here again, we highlight the connection between the prevalence and timeline of constipation and Parkinson's. The research raises the consideration that the changes in the gut, often preceding and predictive of Parkinson's, are evident many years before neuromotor symptoms. To the right, I have listed just a handful of original research papers analyzing the microbiome in Parkinson's, where the Parkinson's subjects had very significantly higher levels of constipation versus healthy controls. In order to test the theory behind the gut microbiome connection in Parkinson's, this study recruited relatively newly diagnosed Parkinson's patients who were drug-naive and compared them to healthy controls. They were evaluated for intestinal permeability as well as subject to intestinal biopsies. I know you're not an expert in immunohistochemical staining, and neither am I. However, shown here we see nitrotyrosine, which is a measure of oxidative stress, and alpha-synuclein abundance. Alpha-synuclein is a protein which is the main component of the Lewy bodies, which is the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's, and E. coli, from one of the Parkinson's subjects as compared to one of the healthy controls. There are significant differences between E. coli invasion, E. coli is an established opportunistic pathogen, alpha-synuclein formation and nitrotyrosine. The authors go on to state, quote, very importantly, we found that the increased intestinal permeability and E. coli staining significantly correlated with alpha-synuclein staining in Parkinson's subjects, but not in controls. In this study, three patients who had undergone a screening colonoscopy with biopsy or polyp removal, taken two to five years before the first reported symptom of Parkinson's, were compared to specimens from 23 healthy controls. The three Parkinson subjects showed immunostaining for alpha-synuclein two and five years before the first motor symptoms. No similar immunostaining was seen in the 23 healthy controls. Given this intestinal pathological evidence, years before the onset of motor symptoms, it begs the question of Parkinson's screening during routine colonoscopies. Now that we've attempted to highlight the gut origination theory behind Parkinson's disease, let's take a look at the players behind the scenes. I've combined the published data over the years and have found 29 original research papers, which analyze the fecal microbiome differences between Parkinson's subjects and healthy controls, of which 26 papers had usable data. The beneficial data which stood out the most are shown graphically here. Quite consistently, the genera Fecalibacterium, Carpococcus, Fusicatenibacter, Roseburia, and Blausia were significantly higher in healthy controls. Each study serves as a data point. You can see Roseburia to the right highlighted as an example. At the genus level, 10 studies showed Roseburia to be significantly higher in healthy controls as compared to Parkinson's subjects. Its species, Roseburia intestinalis, itself was independently significantly different in two studies, one of which, a repeat from the genus level, and the species Roseburia inelinivorans was also shown to be independently significantly higher in healthy controls. Again, a repeat, hence the gray highlight. At no point was Roseburia significantly higher in the Parkinson's subjects from any of the 26 studies. These taxa you see here in green on the wheel chart have all been shown to be incredibly health-promoting, albeit to varying degrees, across the many disease states I've analyzed over the years 
in my role as director of medical education for a microbiome firm. Most of the taxes shown here come from the family Lachnospiraceae, which itself at the family level was shown to be significantly higher in healthy controls in nine studies. Let's give some perspective to the health promoting tax that we've seen in the Parkinson's affected microbiome. This is a slide you'll see often in my presentations. This is the accumulation of thousands of hours of work determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health promoting taxa of the gut. These health promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthier cohorts and significantly lower in the unhealthy ones across all diseases, including Parkinson's. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. There are a few health promoting genera not listed here, like Bifidobacterium, Allostypes, and Odoribacter which are in other phyla, but these listed here are the main determinants of health in the gut. These incredible bacteria listed here can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of beauty production. The blue arrows mark the many taxes shown to be significantly reduced in Parkinson's disease. In order to increase their number, you have to feed them the fuel they love. By doing so, you dramatically improve your microbiome and, by extension, your overall health. Now let's look at the taxa from the 26 Parkinson's studies, which are most consistently shown to be significantly higher in Parkinson's as compared to the healthy controls. It's not a surprise to see E. coli with five studies at the genus level and one study at the species level, showing E. coli is significantly higher in Parkinson's subjects. This is in line with our previous slide with the staining. However, others here may be surprising to see. The genus Christosinella is generally associated with health, but here is associated with Parkinson's. The other interesting note about Christosinella is that it's only found in about 30% of all people, which means statistically it would have to be quite elevated here to be significant. But why? No one seems to know. The same is true for Acromantium acinophyta, the genus and species data being one and the same. Why is it so high on Parkinson's? is considered health promoting in general, especially a metabolic syndrome. Since we want to do no harm, I advise any Parkinson's patient against taking any Acromantium acinophyla containing supplements. At least I can explain why the genera Lactobacillus, Bifidobacterium, and Enterococcus are significantly higher in Parkinson's subjects versus healthy controls, as you will now see. When it comes to the microbiome in various disease states, generally correlation does in fact equal causation. However, in Parkinson's, that is not necessarily the case. The microbiome possesses thousands of enzymes, which have a myriad of activities. Some of them can play a large role in drug metabolism, as we see here with L-DOPA. On the left side, Enterococcus fecalis and facium, along with Lactobacillus brevis and other taxa, all have been shown to possess the enzyme aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, which converts the popular Parkinson's drug L-DOPA to dopamine, rendering it unavailable for the brain. From a number of other studies, we know that Lactobacillus, other taxa, and especially Bifidobacterium are highly correlated with COMT inhibitor use, which is another Parkinson's drug. And these are just the ones we know about. This can help explain why drug therapy outcome is so variable among patients and why administering broad-spectrum antibiotics has been shown to improve L-DOPA therapy. I recommend the avoidance of probiotics in Parkinson's patients, given the data you've seen here on the last two slides. I guarantee no one else is mentioning this. In fact, there are probably a lot of well-intentioned doctors recommending probiotics to their Parkinson's patients. But if they were better informed, they wouldn't. Instead, I highly recommend feeding the amazing health-promoting bacteria, which have been shown to be significantly reduced in the Parkinson's gut. Bacteria which do not exist as supplements, but can be fed with precise and intelligent prebiotic supplementation. When we strip away all of the studies where Parkinson's drugs can influence the microbiome, we are left with only three papers with drug-naive patients, which are displayed here. We see that two of the three, Roseburia, is significantly reduced in Parkinson's, while Acromantia mycinophila is significantly increased. Roseburia and Acromantia appear to play a role in the initiation of Parkinson's. However, having reviewed almost 1,000 original research papers across many disease states, this initial Parkinson's microbiome profile is not very dysbiotic. 
there may be more going on here than we know. Of course, three drug-naive papers is not a large sample size, but it's all we have for now. Now let's briefly look at disease progression data. Here on the left, the stages of disease severity are defined for you. To the right, you can see that acromancia is significantly associated with alpha-synuclein deposition and symptomology, while the genera Fusicatenibacter, and not shown here, Fecalibacterium and Blausha, are all three significantly disassociated with alpha-synuclein deposition and symptomology. Let's look at just one more disease progression study. These researchers analyzed fecal bacterial composition of 24 Parkinson's patients and 14 healthy volunteers by using 16S sequencing. As you can see here in the top row, Enterococcus, which as you know is impacted by Parkinson's drug use, and Escherichia shigella, which are grouped together here due to the limitations of 16S technology, were significantly associated with disease progression. Conversely, on the bottom row, the genera Belousia fecalibacterium, which is a superhero of the gut, and another remarkably health-promoting genus, Ruminococcus, were all significantly inversely associated with disease. Now, we'll take a look at a fecal microbiota transplant study, from here on referred to as FMT. What is FMT? It's when you take fecal matter, which is full of microbes, of course, from healthy donors and transplant it into dysbiotic subjects who typically would have their microbiome sterilized by high doses of antibiotics before the therapy. It's a profound way to alter the microbiome, happens at a clear time point, and exemplifies without a doubt the impact of the microbiome on health. We can see here in this paper that following FMT, there were significant improvements in all measures of motor and non-motor symptoms, and these are correlated with significant changes in various taxa. For example, we see a significant increase in post-FMT fecalibacterium levels, as evidenced by the red arrows in figure A and by the chart in figure C. We also see a significant decrease in post-FMT Escherichia levels, as evidenced by the purple arrows in figure A and also by the chart in figure D. We see that a drastic change in the microbiome is able to drive significant symptom improvement. Thus, the connection appears obvious. Additionally, the mean disease duration for these subjects was over seven years, and yet FMT was able to drive significant symptom improvement shown in Table 2. Also of note was that remission of constipation was observed in all patients. This paper illustrates very well the power of the microbiome. The next best thing to FMT is to drive significant change in the microbiome with properly chosen, properly dosed, and blended prebiotics. Over the years, the many conditions I've analyzed do not have the exact same microbial fingerprint, but they do have the same theme. This is true with Parkinson's disease. So which prebiotics are best suited for this dysbiotic microbiome? First, we have to consider which keystone taxa we want to focus on. The meta-analysis informs us that the classic health promoters, Roseburia, F. prausitzii, Carpococcus, and Fusicatenibacter should be optimized along with the genus Blausia. Then we have to match these up to my meta-analysis of prebiotics, highlighting which taxa prefer which substrates. We also have to consider the prevalence of constipation in Parkinson's as it pertains to our selection of prebiotics. Of course, the dose has to be sufficient to drive for environmental change. And how does one shop for these prebiotics efficiently? For the protocol recommendations, you should know I have no affiliations with any of these companies. Arabinoxylans are very concentrated in bran. Therefore, the best hypoallergenic source is rice bran. Now Foods has an affordable, stabilized rice bran powder, which is easy to find. Inulin powder is also easy to find. Just make sure it's a powder and has no other ingredients. As for partially hydrolyzed guar gum, the best product is from the Thorn Research, called FiberMend. As of yet, I have still not found an acceptable pectin-only supplement. Therefore, for pectin intake, I recommend two Granny Smith apples a day in addition to your shakes with the other prebiotics. Psyllium is another easy product to find. Buy whatever you're most comfortable with. For the first month, you'll be consuming two shakes per day. The goal is to drive significant shift in your microbiome. You'll be blending all the prebiotics together in a shaker bottle. You'll be using the scooper that is included with the Fibermin container for the Fibermin, stabilized rice bran, and the psyllium, not for the inulin. 
For that, you'll use a heaping teaspoon. The texture of inulin is such that it doesn't heap very much, but don't worry. Make sure you add the psyllium last as it gels very quickly. As soon as you've added the psyllium, consume the shake. Don't forget, you'll also need to eat two apples a day on this regimen. If you watch this video during its release, I will host a free roundtable webinar this Thursday evening for the Microbiome University members with questions pertaining to this presentation. If you saw this after the fact, you'll be able to view the house roundtable. If you still need further assistance, you can make an appointment to speak with me on Fridays.